Hello, everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Atkin. I'm your host, Olivia Atkin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We give you real-life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top-notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Jonathan Alston. Jonathan played professional football in the NFL with the Washington Redskins in 2006 and the Seattle Seahawks in 2007 and played in the NFL Europe League in 2007 as well. Jonathan is now the co-founder and chief operating officer for the Beyond Now Foundation. In partnership with parents and schools, the goal of Beyond Now Foundation is to encourage a love of learning, inspire compassionate communities, and advocate for innovative pathways that equip marginalized students with real opportunities for long-term success. You can find Jonathan by going to his website, beyondnow-te.org, or by emailing him at john.alston at beyondnow-te. Dot org or on Instagram at beyondnow.te. Hello, Jonathan. It's fantastic having you on the show today. Olivia, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. You know, uh, thank you for the invite and uh, give me an opportunity to talk a little bit more about what we're doing. I'm very excited because you and I have talked about your journey and it's very inspirational to where you are now. And we're going to cover it all. But to start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like to Jonathan Alston? Well, I, I, I think success is a, is a moving target, to be quite honest. You know, but for me, uh, with where I am right now, you know, the, it's the ability to continue to, you know, work on yourself so that you can help others. Um, you know, to me, success is not only me achieving my goals, but it's, it's giving others the opportunity around me to be successful as well. And for us, when I say us, my wife and I, that's how we've always lived. That's how we've always witnessed our parents and grandparents operate. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have to learn to be selfless, you know, so that, you know, you can continue to help, period. You know, whether it's an intentional format from a nonprofit or if it's just helping a neighbor, you know, for me, that's success because it comes back to you. I think that's so important because, as you said, when you're selfless, it comes back to you, but it's demonstrating the compassion and kindness that we need more in the world today. And you mentioned in that answer as well how you and your wife have been together for a long time, have been working together for a while. And I want to go back to the beginning, because when you and I have talked in the past, your experience in college, as well as playing pro at your age, was quite different than a lot of individuals experience who were your peers the same age as you. And I think from hearing it from you, it really not only stood out when we talk about mental health how to look at your trajectory of life and how different things that happen can really shape you, but how you can use the experiences you go through every single day to help shape others. So Jonathan, can you delve more into your perspective when you were a college football player and a young NFL player and how it was different then most of your peers and how that shaped your insights and perspective on things. Yeah, you know, for, for me, it's more of a reflect of a reflection point because, you know, going through it at the time, you know, I I, I obviously didn't have that that reflection and and I, I probably couldn't state it as state it as eloquently as I can now, you know, but for me, my wife and I, we met our freshman year at University of South Carolina, you know, and, you know, I was a scholarship guy, um, could have went to a lot of different colleges, but chose South Carolina because of relationships. Um, that's another thing when I talk about success is that, you know, it's not about the money uh, because that will come, 
but it's about really having genuine people in your life, having those genuine relationships in your life. So for me, my wife and I, you know, got together, um, you know, we, we connected automatically, not knowing each other, but now after 19 years, I mean, 19 years, we've been married in June, uh, you know, we, we, we come to understand that, you know, we have so many synergies when it comes to helping for folks, when it comes to leading with love, when it comes to getting the job done, you know, but all that's great. You know, we, we, <laughs> you also have to figure out how to, how to feed your family. So for me, you know, I, at a young age, my wife and I had my daughter, Jaira, you know, at the age of 19. Um, and while many folks were trying to figure themselves out and, and on a trajectory of achieving different goals, you know, my wife and I, we had to figure out how to raise this child and continue on with life. Um, our parents, um, are tremendous, you know, but from a financial standpoint, did not have the resources to support us in that, you know, so I, I really want to give a shout out to my wife because, you know, she stopped going to school to work full time. Um, I did continue on with school and football, but I worked part time as well. Uh, we moved in together to raise our family and not put, you know, our responsibility off on someone else. And, uh, you know, a lot of my teammates make jokes because when I reflect now, when we're telling stories, I'm not a part of a lot of the stories because I was working or with my family, you know, at the age of 19, you know. So for me, you know, already being a leader on many of the teams that I've played on from high school into college, you know, that was another, you know, prior priority leadership role as a father. You know, and at that time as a as a partner to my wife and, you know, it just spilled over into every area of my life. So for me, reflecting even now, you know, the and, and I truly believe this, the way you do one thing is the way you do all things. You know, so with me learning how to be a leader early, early on and learning how to be selfless and witnessing that through my family, you know, it, it, it was hard at first. But, you know, it, it gave me the opportunity, you know, to uh, to transition well um, and, and have that hope. I think that's one thing that people lack a lot of times today, too, is can I do that? You know, how can I do that? I'm just me. How can I do these different things? And for me, that when I look back, you know, and I tell my story now, I want to encourage folks that you can do it. You know, sometimes that comes out old school, John, or me being like my dad, John, when I'm too tough, because a lot of times I can't always relate to that 19 year old that just doesn't want to go to work, you know, versus having to change diapers, mix formula, you know, and, and, and go to class, go to practice, you know, make sure my relationship with my wife is OK. You know, it's a lot. You know, I know for me, what you alluded to on the mental health side, you know, that same year when I found out that my wife was pregnant, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't all, you know, uh, roses. Um, I think I, I, I was typically a, a three plus GPA guy, you know, being on the offensive line, you know, school was never harder for me. But when I found out that as a 19 year old that my wife was pregnant, I think that semester, that first semester, I had a 1.8. Um, I just, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know what resources to reach out to. Yes, I prayed because that's what I knew. My dad taught me that. But, you know, I didn't have other resources and I didn't feel like I can go to other people because other people didn't have kids. Um, you know, so I remember I, I dropped down to a 1.8. The fast forward when my beautiful wife had my beautiful daughter on November 6th, you know, um, a month later, you know, my my one of my close friends was shot and killed. Um, and for me, you know, we weren't offered the resources to deal with those things at the time. You know, when it came to, you know, having a child, yes, everybody, this is a beautiful child and all that other stuff. And yes, we had great support from our family. We never we never went without a meal and all these different things. And and I don't want to call out the boosters that helped us out during that time. You know, I wish we had NIL money back then, right? You know, but we did it and we made it through, you know. And for me, you know, even with the, the passing of or when my buddy got shot, we didn't have any counselors. You know, we didn't go to a psychologist. 
you know, we sat down with the coaches and the police department telling our story to make sure that we didn't get in trouble and that we could be eligible for the next season, right? You know, so again, you know, my journey in college was a little bit different, but I went and traded for, for the world because, you know, again, you know, in college, you know, I learned early to raise my family in college. I learned early, you know, about teamwork through sports, about achieving goals. You know, even with the child, I had the opportunity to graduate early, you know, and, and focus on my family in the NFL uh, to start our lives off, um, you know, a little bit better. Um, and, and even in that, you know, Olivia, you know, I, I went to the Washington Redskins as a free agent. Um, you know, I remember draft day, you know, getting a call from the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, I have a deep, deep dislike for Dallas. <laughs> all right. And it's not just because I was a Redskin or commander. Um, it was because on draft day as a young man, you know, I'm sitting there and you got to remember this was on a Sunday. So I guess the second day of the draft at that time. And I was sitting at my parents' house by myself. Okay. Because you got to remember my dad is a pastor. He is not missing church for anything. Okay. But they did rent the big screen TV for me and all that little stuff. But it was just me and my wife and my daughter sitting at my parents' house. My mom had all the food cooked. Everything was ready for them to come back from church. And, uh, you know, and I remember getting a call before the draft started that day. And uh, the offensive line coach said, hey, John, we're going to get you. So, you know, I'm a young kid. I'm calling everybody in the family. I'm calling everyone. Hey, I'm excited that, hey, I'm, I'm about to be a cowboy. You know. I'm telling my brother to go to the store and pick up a Dallas hat for me. You know, everything. I'm excited. So round by round goes by, nobody called. And and for me, in hindsight, that was a blessing in disguise because my agent, you know, at the time, Philip Wickstrom, he reached out and said, hey, man, we've got eight teams that we can choose from to give you the best opportunity to make the team. You know, so out of all those teams, the Washington Redskins was, was a, a great fit not only for personnel reasons, but also, too, is a little bit closer to home, you know, from Charleston. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Excuse me. I'm from Latson, South Carolina, a town outside of Charleston. Everybody always wants to say the big city. I'm from a small town called Latson, South Carolina. And it's about a seven-hour drive, which is not too bad versus being on the West Coast or something like that. You know, so ended up going to Washington and having to compete for 15 there were, there were 60 rookies in the rookie camp, and eight guys were going to make it. On the offensive line, there were 15 guys, and two guys were going to make it. So when I first got to camp, nobody knew my name. You know, uh, Joe Bugle called me guy off the street for the first week. You know, but my thing was going back to what I learned as a young man, hard work. All right, there's no, there's no pill for success or anything else. If you got a vision, if you got a dream, you got to work your ass off and you got to get the right people around you to help you become a reality. So for me, when I got to that rookie camp, I want to make sure everybody could see me. And I was blessed, you know, in the, in the fact that God prepares you before you do things. You know, you just have to realize it. And for me, I started as a DN in college. My wife got pregnant. I ate with her. I gained 30 pounds. And then I played on the offensive line. I thought it was the worst thing in the world. But it was a blessing for me because I could play every position on the line except center. So when I got the rookie camp, I played every position and coach saw me. And when I made the team, he was like, you weren't the best, but you outworked everybody, you know, and and that was huge. Now, the other thing was I had many coaches to tell me, do not bring your family up there. Don't even get married. Well, you know what? Right before training camp. All right. In June, on June 25th. Training camp is in July. I married my wife of 19 years. I brought everybody with me because to me, you know, that 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 was a healthy pressure that I wanted to put on myself um, to make it, to be successful in that in that lane. Right. You know, so every week, you know, my first year I was on the practice squad and I got my wife who went back to school to, and finished her nursing degree. Let me add that. Um, and before I went to practice, I had to take my daughter to daycare. You know, I wasn't just going straight to practice. Still got those responsibilities. Also, too, I was the only rookie, 
you know, on the offensive line because we had two guys, one other guy, he made it, he made the team and quit. I think he just wanted to see if he could do it. So now I'm the only rookie offensive lineman. So offensive linemen, they are notorious when it comes to uh, welcoming a rookie. And for me, you know, my thing was they would send me across town every morning to buy these horrible bu- breakfast burritos um, from this uh, Hispanic restaurant across town, almost 30 minutes away. And I had to drop off my daughter to uh, daycare, you know, and be on time. In the NFL, you get fined for everything. It's not just, it's not like business, you know, uh, you know, I currently work for waste management. If I'm late at waste management, I just call somebody and say, hey, I'm going to be running late. With the, with the, in the NFL, if you're late, you're going to get fined. You know, so I remember my first week, I got two speeding tickets. Just trying to, trying to be on time, you know, and, uh, at this point, they call it bribery, but I didn't know it. I was just being a nice guy, offering the, the, the police officers, you know, paraphernalia I got in my car. Hey, do you want this? Do you want this signed T-shirt or whatever else? And I was trying to be nice to get out of it, which I still got the tickets. And I learned how to uh, leave a little bit early, you know. But, you know, again, my, my experience going from college, you know, to going to the pros was a little bit different because it was just driven by really – uh, feeding my family and 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 really, you know, uh, executing a vision for the future so my family would have a future. Um, I always, you know, uh, was I never made a big deal out of a lot of things that that I did because a second part of that, I've always watched a lot of folks before me do it. I was blessed to see a lot of folks before me play in the NFL, you know, or become business owners or become you know, work in, the, work in the community. I mean, my parents, I've seen them work in the community all, all their lives. So as I've continued to go on, I've continued to take those things with me, you know, and now, you know, it's kind of like I feel I feel like I'm doing a disservice when I don't walk in those things that that God has uh, blessed me to to uh, to operate in. And and that's the thing. And that story demonstrates so many aspects that I want to highlight, you know, the aspect that as a PK kid, and for those of you who don't know, it's the pastor's kid, um, it really demonstrates in your story that even on a Sunday, when for so many families, when you talk about draft day, for example, it's like, now you see these videos of all these people, but as a PK kid, Church comes first. Hey, listen, listen. My mom, every Sunday in college, would call me <laughs> at 5.30 in the morning. Hey, what you doing? Mom, I'm just getting back from the party last night. <laughs> I wouldn't tell her that. I wouldn't tell her that. I was trying to straighten up on the other line real quick. You know, but but it, it, it was a different lifestyle, and, and, and I'm thankful for it because, you know, even though I would always question coming up, you know, man, why do I have to, you know, go cut everybody in the, in the church's grass? Or why do I have to, you know, come in early when all my buddies are hanging out? But for me, it gave me that discipline to know my limits. Always. I could, I could, I could intentionally try to do dirt. And I'd always see my dad's face, you know, even to this day. You know, and that's the cool, it's the cool thing because that's when you know your limits. You know, one thing I talk about with the kids right now, we have um we have our, our free football camp for kids. You know, we have our third annual one coming up on Father's Day weekend, uh, June 5th at South Carolina State. It's called Take the Lead Camp. And one thing I talk, to, talk about all the time with the kids is learning how to lead yourself first so that you can lead others. You know, if you can't lead yourself first, you know, then don't try to lead somebody else because now it's the blind leading the blind, right? You know, so for me, you know, as a PK, as you said, you know, that has helped me out tremendously. But you got to remember, my dad wasn't a typical pastor. He was also a Marine, you know. So I was going here, and then I was going here, you know, and uh, and just learning how to get the job done, you know. And me and my wife, you know, always talk about, you know, being success-driven, success results-driven, mm-hmm. you know, being purpose-driven and all those different things. But that came by the way we were raised and having, you know, just dope parents that that were consistent 
Um, not to say that they were perfect, you know, but they were consistent, you know, in teaching us those things, but leading with love. And that's what we're trying to do right now. You know, I mean, I can tell you so many stories, even after football, where everybody's thinking that I'm a millionaire and, you know, I'm going through challenges. You know, I remember, I remember after football, you know, um, <laughs> I remember after football, you know, my, my son being born, you know, and that same week, you know, my, my poor wife, man, she had two C-sections, you know, and my son, he was born seven years later after my daughter. And uh, at this time, I was just finished playing football. And she had a C-section. She was laying in the hospital upstairs. And little did I know, I had a kidney disorder that I was dealing with. And I had to walk downstairs to the emergency room saying, hey, I got this swelling in different places that I'm not familiar with. And I was put in the hospital for a week to understand what's going on with my kidneys. But even in that, I remember, you know, a lot of my friends stopping by saying, how can you be so positive right now when your wife is laying upstairs, you're laying down here, nobody in the house is working. I'm like, man, because it's going to be okay, man. Like, you know, <laughs> they don't understand the stories that I've heard from my grandparents going through you know, times where they couldn't even go to the store when they wanted or go to the front entrance of a store when they wanted, you know. So for me to to be able to afford care at that time, I don't have that much problems. You know, this is easy. This is, I mean, it's not easy, you know, but I'm going to get through it, you know. Um, you know, so for me, it's, it's, it's always a story of continual perseverance and understanding that when I go through something or my family goes through something, it ain't, it's not just for us. It's for it. It's to help others that are around us that might be going through the same thing that think they're alone. And you're not alone, buddy. You know, I mean, <laughs> you're not alone at all. You know, I mean, me with a clean shave and a clean shirt on right now, you know, that that's what it, it hasn't always been that, you know, but I'm just thankful for, you know, God continuing to allow me and my family to go to different levels in our lives, but still be able to help, you know, the guy on the street or even help the CEO, you know, in, in, in the back office who, uh, you know, who has no clue, you know, about, about real life. So, Jonathan, what made you decide after your NFL career and your journey through different jobs and finding your footing in post-NFL life to start the Beyond Now Foundation? You know what, that that's... That was in the works for years. You know, me and my wife used to lay uh, in, 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 our, in my dorm room, 411, East Quad, University of South Carolina. And, you know, even with the child, we tried to maintain some of our uh, childlikeness in us, our youth in us, because we had to grow up fast. And I remember we'd lay in the bed and my room would face the window. And we just dreamed. You know, first we start off by playing the game, your car, my car, right? Looking out the window, hey, that's going to be my car. That's going to be my car, right? You know, and that might seem small to a lot of people, you know, but that's where we are at in the place in our lives. Like, we wanted a nice car, we wanted a nice house. Everybody wants nice things. We did that. You know, we talk, We used to talk about even how we decorate our house. And you look at our house now, that's how it is. You know, I was tall. We were gonna, we knew we was gonna have tall kids. So if you're short, you know, there's probably one or two chairs you can sit on, sit in in my house. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, how our, both of our families would always help the community. You know, God bless my grandma, her or my wife's grandmother. She's no longer here, you know, but she would feed the whole community. You know, help with food with uh with the food banks and and clothing drives. And this is down in a rural Eston, South Carolina, where there's very low poverty rate, but people always found a way to help others and make things work. My father, I'm 41 years old. My father's been a pastor for 42 years. I watched him all my life and I participated all my life with helping others. I used to watch my grandparents. My grandfather had a seventh grade education. My grandmother, you know, I, I think she didn't go further than high school. All right. They had 10 kids. They fed the community. My grandfather was a habitual fisherman. That was his vice. He didn't even eat fish. Didn't we? His fishing day was Saturdays. 
He didn't go to any of the grandkids' weddings because that was his fishing day. Okay, but he would take the fish, he would clean it, freeze it, and give it to folks in the community. He had fields. We do the same thing. So for us, this is a part of our heritage. This is a part of our legacy. This is part of us letting our family live on. So it wasn't so much of, all right, I'm an NFL guy. I don't want to have this nonprofit. It was like, no, this is God's work that we want to continue on, but we got to be intentional so that we can help more people than just the folks that are in our community. We want to, we want, right now we're starting at the ground level, but we want this thing to grow and not only grow from a standpoint of just having our brand on something, which is beyond now, but we want to encourage people to get off the bench because a lot of times what's happening right now, a lot of folks will get tied up in the social media and all these different distractions and forget to help the neighbor or just forget to help the guy that's pushing the car down the, down the road by himself. You know, so if we can encourage hope for other people to take a- people to take action, we're winning. All right. If we can be intentional to 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 establish beyond now foundation and the different things that we're doing in the community, then we're winning. I don't want to just say that I want to help one child because I'm in business. And if I only sell one one piece of one product, then I'm then I'm not winning. All right. That's all cool and everything. But what we want to do is is have a movement, have a movement to where we inspire hope, togetherness, get rid of all this division. Because right now, where we live at in this world today, with it being an election year, with everything going on in the world, you look at Israel and everything else, we got to be intentional with hope and we got to lead with love. So, again, you talk about why I started. It wasn't just like, oh, Eureka. You know, it was a combination of everything that God put in me and my wife's eyes. And I'm so thankful for my wife because she is the brains of this operation. I'm the mouthpiece. I'll sit there and talk all day, you know, but she's been very instrumental with helping us put the organization of everything behind the scenes, keeping me straight, getting me to slow down. Um, And that's a beautiful thing too, because, you know, with the nonprofit, even though my wife and I have worked together since we were 19 year old, but even before that, you know, doing it intentionally with the nonprofit, you know, is even a blessing as well. So as you had mentioned, you are starting out and you have goals to get it at a diff- very different level, at a very different pace. What do you hope to provide communities locally and nationally through the foundation? And what do you hope really sparks people's thought processes and how they approach situations by bringing awareness to your foundation. Oh, absolutely, man. You know, from an awareness standpoint, you know, that's why we plug, you know, the uh, Instagram, the emails and everything else. You know, this is not, you know, a lot of times I think people get nonprofits and they get too much. I want to run a nonprofit like a business but I'm not looking to leave a legacy of I made this much money. Yes, we want a lot of money to touch a lot of people's lives. But for us, when it comes down to it, I also want, there's a lot of, I'll say it like this, there's a lot of warriors out there that are already doing their thing. They're already doing very, This is we're not recreating anything. This is not, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mind, a mind blowing idea. No, this is us just being intentional and really using all the platforms that we have push this initiative which is our kids our communities hope period you know again a lot of times there's such a big gap in the united states to where people forget that there's a lot of people in need right here at home we don't have to go to another country just go around the corner all right playing in the nfl you think about this you understand this with the giants all right so when you look at every one of those stadiums all right and you go two blocks away what do you see, Olivia? All right, you see the inner see cities. Poverty. It's a lot of the poverty. Inner city, you see poverty, you see need. All right, even in some of, even in, even if when you go out to the rural, you know, it's now it's more rural because now you have beautification that pushes everybody out, and now the, the problem is rural. All right, and everybody forgets about it. You know, so for us, you know, our goal is to partner, you know, with other nonprofits or to encourage. You know, and I'll use it like this. My brethren, 
All right, my NFL brethren that think that they don't have a platform in me anymore, but you do, and it's a lot bigger than what you think. All right, and we'll show you what to do. We'll give you the blueprint because, again, I have many teammates that I know and don't know that come from where I come from or where my wife comes from that can just do the same thing. All right, my wife and I work full time. We got two kids. We help our parents. We help our communities. But we do this nonprofit too. And my thing is, I want people to know that. All right, I got a foot in. I got a foot in this other life with the NFL, but I'm a damn regular guy, you know, that's trying to make a difference. And again, collectively, you know, I want others to join our movement to be able to do this. Okay, you know, not only are we focusing on community, but we're talking about it at a at a at a big level. At a, at a, at a, you know, we partner with the South Carolina Highway Patrol. You know, I wanted, we're going to be doing community events in South Carolina with them. You know, I have a love, 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 love. You see the green and everything else. I have a love for the military. Okay. I want our military to be strong again with enrollment. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, so from, from the kids to the adults, you know, we're not, I'm not just talking about having nice carnivals and everything else like that. What we're talking about is making an effective change that makes and I don't want to say it like this because I'm not Donald Trump or something like that, but it's not making America great again. It's just making America great, you know, because if we say making America great again, then that goes back toward, you know, ideologies that we've grown past and where we are now. So when I say make America great, you know, it's a new vision, you know, it's us thrusting forward and it takes everybody. Me and my wife can't do it alone because we're, we're already tired as hell. And it's interesting how you bring up, and I want to highlight this from the aspect of the NFL as well. The part you mentioned with where stadiums are built, you know, the communities that really hold stadiums, when we talk NFL, MLB, you know, sometimes players, and I've experienced this firsthand, and Johnny probably have seen it, there's a sense of, I've made it, everyone else can make it, and they forget sometimes where they come from. And I think when players walk out of the stadium or the training camp and start their drive home, a lot of times that's the reminder that, oh, wait, even though like this is where I am today and this is the job I have, look at the community, look at those people. And that is what I think brings us, brings players sometimes and even people who work in the leagues back to earth that like it can seem so glamorous, but the other aspect that a lot of people don't realize, and you and I have had conversations on this, is just because what you see on TV is not what it is every single day. You know, the average length of a player is three seasons. And that's, mind you, Having the Tom Brady's, the Eli Manning's, Peyton Manning's, like their numbers are in that mix. So obviously they're going to bring it up. The average salary is much different than you see on TV. And then you got to cut it into, depending on if you're living in the same state you're playing, day tax, it's very different. So when people get this sense of, Oh, you're that celebrity. You played in the NFL. What are you doing here? What do your journey lead you here? It's like, I I always remind people when they ask me about working with players and working in professional sports, I go, they worked to get to that top of the mountain. And when their time is up, they're going to be starting at the bottom again. So never forget that today's top of the mountain can be tomorrow's bottom. and that. It is much different. Just as hard as they work to get to that top, those are the worth ethics and the mindset that will help them get to the top of the next mountain. Absolutely, man. You know, so you you know, you're opening up another can of worms with me when you made that statement. You know what you're doing now, Olivia. You know, so for me, you know, you, you know, think about it like this. You know, the averages, the whole nine. And I want to touch on something that you just said in respect to. I guess mindset of folks that are in the building and players and everything else, you know, 
I mean, and what you see on TV, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it's a it's a perspective that's given, you know, really, really kind of like a, an illusion almost, you know, because you got to think about most athletes, you know, we are a business. I don't care any way you put it or anything else, you know, from Little League. Yes, Little League. I had I had. The neighboring high school coach trying to get my uncle to get us to go to the other school because we were big kids and everything else. Yes, it starts in and 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 that early, you know, to middle school, high school, college pros, you know. So with that being said, people go out of their way to help you succeed. All right, you know, for some, you know, you have people around you to really teach you those skills to help you learn how to succeed yourself and how to put the work in yourself and how to be empowered. But for others, they don't get that. You know what I mean? Because there's such superstars from an athletic standpoint without the other tools to where when they get, you know, to that NFL standpoint and then it's gone, they can't operate. And it's tough. You know, I mean, and mental health, tough, suicidal, tough. You know, all these different things tough that not only football players deal with, but other sports, you know, the military, law enforcement, everybody, you know. So, again, you know, I know for me, um, I was smiling very big because I, always, I, I thought I was rich coming up, you know, and I was. I was rich in family. I was rich in faith. I was rich in the things that you can't buy. And I always went home. I couldn't wait to go, home, you know. And not to show off, but like I knew, I knew, you know, the the crew, which is my family, that helped me get to where I was, you know. But you talk about being in a position to where, you know, people are like, "Well, why are you here?" All right, let me tell you guys this quick story, real quick, and 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 you shut me up if I'm going too long, you know. But after football, you know, for me, I was very lofty. You know, I was like, man, I'm going to go back to South Carolina where I went to school and find a great job. But you got to remember, my last year playing was 2008. What was the economy like in 2008? All right. You know, so I wasn't paying attention to all that stuff because I was focusing on football and everything else. So I got out and I ended up I wanted to teach and coach. I had my degree, everything else. And one of my buddies were like, we were at a fundraiser um, and I got everybody's card in the room, not trying, just talking to everybody. Cause I really, really, really enjoy talking to people. I want to hear different people's stories and I love relationships, but I walked away probably with a hundred, a stack of business cards, man. And my buddy was like, you need to go into sales. You need to go into business. Like, what are you doing? I was like, nope, I'm a teaching coach. And the fast forward, I remember connecting with this small company of 50 and uh, started started in, you know, I didn't start directly in sales, you know, because, again, my resume just said football, football. It had my degree. It had the different uh, community stuff I was a part of at that time, but it didn't have any hard skills. I had the soft skills, but everybody at that time was looking at just hard skills. All right. So I started out as a tech. All right. I went from playing in the NFL to starting out as a tech and I had a family to raise, everything else. And I think I was making like $25,000 a year. Now, again, for a lot of people, that's a lot of money. But coming from, you know, NFL money to that, you know, where I still had a lot of NFL bills, my house, car, everything else. I remember that first year, you know, my, my truck I repossessed and I was like, whatever. Just let it go, you know, as long as we still got the house we eating, you know. And then I was blessed to where I, I, I paid a lot less for an Impala um, to drive my family around, which was a company car, of the company I was working on. And, and that was a blessing, you know. So being humbled in that, and finally I got into the sales, pro, sales part of everything, and things just soared because that's my, that's my gift, talking to people, connect. That's my gift. So I remember... You know, I got to the point where I was working right directly with the CEO, getting him into different doors, launching new products that he couldn't launch before because he didn't have the connections and things were going great, you know. And then, boom, we were called in December 16th, right a week before Christmas. 
we cannot pay you guys anymore. You're going to have to get unemployment. Oh, so in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, I got, I got these three contracts we just signed. I just give me my commission, you know, because I know you guys are going to continue on with those contracts. You're probably going to change the name of the company, go bankrupt, and, and still have those contracts. I know the game. Well, I've seen the game, you know. So, lo and behold, that happened. I did not get paid. And my wife and I were like, you know what? You know, as a 20-something-year-old kid, I'm thankful for mentors. One thing I want to say to everybody, I always have a mentor and a mentee because that's going to keep you keep you grounded and guided and everything else. And I remember talking to one of my mentors, which was a former coach, and he told me, just let it go. It's going to come back. And I was like, how can this coach tell me this? The same guy that I watched in a staff meeting, not a football staff meeting, but a business staff meeting with his company, throw a microwave to break a point. And you're telling me to calm down? Like, as a 20-something-year-old kid, I'm like, let's let's fight. Let's go. You know, and uh, long story short, you know, my wife and I, you know, made a decision, you know, to move from South Carolina to Boston. My wife's in healthcare, and, uh, you know, she's able to get a job up there, but I couldn't find anything. All right? And never say what you wouldn't do, especially if you got others counting on you, your family or whatever else. Because I remember, you know, just getting on with a uh, with a uh, temp agency. Marathon was the name of the company. And um, I remember my first assignment was working in that warehouse, sorting books for a library. And at that time, I'm a, I was still a big dude, you know, and everybody's looking at me like, dude, you didn't play football or anything else? And I was, I never, I never leave with it because I'm like, I don't want anybody to know my business. All right. So at this point, when they acknowledge it, now I got to tell them, oh, well, yep, I play professional football. I'm right here stacking books with you, sir. You know, and yeah, by the way, I got my degree. And, you know, uh, I, instead of watching TV, I read a lot of books. Yeah, but I'm right here, you know, storing books, you know. And, and, but for me, it was like, all right. Once I got past that initial embarrassment and really understood the humility in it all, you know, I went to the next project. And the next project was, you know, shoveling snow at Hanscom Air Force Base, where I was a supervisor driving in the snow, driving in type in that type of snow in Boston that I didn't experience in, in Northern Virginia. It's totally different up there. Like it's a different beast. It's a, I mean, it's it's no different, in my opinion, to Canada when I played in Canada. All right. You know, so I remember driving these young kids at the time. I'm in my mid to the, I'm in my mid 20s and the kids I'm driving there in their early 20s, you know, some of their late teens. And they don't know that I've never drove an 18 passenger van before. They don't know that I've never driven in this deep and, and, and this type of snow. So I remember just smiling like I am now, but on the inside, you know, I'm about to have a heart attack. And I remember just saying a prayer. And I remember on the way taking them to Hanscom Air Force Base, a plow truck comes right on the interstate and led me all the way through. You know, and uh, I just remember that, hey, you know, for me, even to this day, you know, when, 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 when there is a obstacle, when there's an opportunity, when there's a challenge right there, just to have that hope and belief to push through, you know, but just to fast forward, but also to regardless of whatever circumstance that you're in, give it your all. All right. Play your position. People don't understand that when I played in the NFL, I never played in a regular season game, but I have four game balls because I understood to play my position on the practice squad. And, and as a backup, you know, I'm, this is my role right now to get others prepared. Okay. You know, so people can get that too. Well, just cause I'm working at McDonald's, I don't matter. Yes, you matter. Okay. Because you might, you're feeding so many people, you're doing all these different things. You know, how many times where I was going through a hard day and I stopped to get a quick sandwich and somebody said something nice to me and I'm ready to go off on the world. You do everybody matters. So the fast forward, the last place that I worked with outside of sales up in Boston was McCall's truck. And we would work from eight to four in the morning. All right. So my schedule was I would work from eight to four in the morning. I take a nap for like an hour or two. All right. Really an hour. Cause I didn't get home until close to like late after five and excuse me, after four. And then I take a nap. My wife had to take the train down to Boston 
because we were on the, on the in the suburbs. So she had she worked in at Tufts Medical in Boston, and I had to get the kids to school, and then I had to interview because I'm not staying where I am right now. I did that's this is not where I'm supposed to be. So I had to interview in the day. All right, pick the kids up, get dinner ready, take a nap, catch my wife in passing. All right, you know, sleep a little bit more, go to work. All right, so I just remember at that time, whenever I was telling football stories with this crew I was with, they were telling prison stories. And at first, I'm like, man, what the hell am I doing here? But you know what? That was one of the best experiences of my life because I dealt with genuine people. I dealt with people that I saw in their lives where God redeemed their lives and they didn't give up, where they still had hope, all right, you know, to where they did crazy stuff. I'm not talking not having a job or whatever. I'm talking about, but at the place where they were at in their lives now, you know, they were able to be redeemed. God redeemed them. You know, I remember working at McCall's truck and I got three promotions within three months. And they were so, and when I left, about to leave, they were mad that I left. And I told him from the beginning, this is not my last stop, but I'm going to give you everything that I got, you know, and a lot of people, you know, don't always understand the significance of giving your all because as an athlete too, we're always conditioned that, you know, my every, eyes are always on us, you know, film is always watching us and everything else. So I live that way. Like I tell my kids now, you know, what if God came back tomorrow and your room's that clean? You know, that's a reflection of you. I try to use that. It don't always work, you know, but in life for myself right now, you know, it's kind of like, all right, you know, if God came back and he put something on my heart to do and I don't do it, it's no different than a missed assignment when you're watching a, when, when, we're, when we're grading football film. The worst mistake you can have is a mental mistake in football because, especially at the pro level, because everybody can play, but not everybody can apply that thought and action as fast as it needs to be done, you know? So for me right now in my life, it's like, okay, all right, if God's put on your heart for you and your wife to do this nonprofit. If you don't do it, it's on you. Mm -hmm. That's on you. I put it, I put on your heart, it's on you. And it's interesting you mentioned, and we're going to wrap up after this, but I want to highlight the two very big sentiments, I think, that were throughout that story you told is we can all be humbled very quickly. So remember how you got to where you are, but also net when you say certain things like, well, I, you would never catch me working there or, you know, stuff like that. Or I would never live in that environment. You never know. And some of it can happen. And I'll take the example of, I'm getting ready to relocate to Alaska because my boyfriend is a chief in the Coast Guard. And that's where he got based. I'm born in the South. Yep. In August, people. He, like, I am that person who lives in the Northeast that in 85 degree weather will wear a sweatshirt because it's cold. Right. Um, and everyone makes fun of me, but I'm like, it's true. It's cold. Um, so I always said I'm never going anywhere colder than the Northeast. And God has laughed at that um, because now I'm moving to Alaska, where I think it's a tad colder. Um, but I always said, you know, I always said I'd stay in my area. Obviously, that hasn't happened. And people go, well, how could you be so OK with it? Because I remember this is the journey I'm on. And even though I said, oh, I will never do that. Life has said, okay, now we're going to set you up so that when that comes up, you will be prepared and you won't look at it as I'll never do it. You look at it as, okay, yes, this is what I'm doing now. And, and I want to add to that, you know, because what you're talking about, what I'm talking about is a lot of time God put us in a position where we're uncomfortable so we can be stretched and grow. And those same things that you verbally say that you never do and all that stuff. You're saying it for a reason, you know what I'm saying? Because it may be something that you don't want to do or whatever else, but you have to go through certain things so God can prepare you for the next thing. So when I look back to every being up in Boston for me, you know, that was a game changer for my whole family. You know, that we 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 leveled up when we came back to the South, you know, salary wise, how close we were, 
faith wise, everything, you know. And for me, you know, as I'm as I'm approached with different things that are out of the norm, I'm like, all right, all right, God, you know what what what, what do we have here? I and then I don't say it always like that because sometimes initially, you know, you're like, oh my God, I got to do this or whatever else. But when you get into it, and if you can really realize that it's it's a setup for success. And not always just for you, but others around you or, or whatever the case may be, you know, then now you're looking at it from a different perspective and you can really get what God is trying to give you to help you be better and also to help somebody else. And I think that's a great sentiment to wrap up the show on. So, Jonathan, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? Again, first things first, you know, uh, I'm on... Uh, <laughs> I'm using a lot of social media now, which I haven't in the past, you know, but our main thing right now is is Instagram. Please follow us on beyond now. Dot T E on Instagram. OK, shoot me a note. All right. If you want to join, you know, join us. If you have your own organization, if you just want to talk, you know, um, shoot me a note at John dot Austin at beyond now dash T E dot org all right and our website is beyond now all right dash te dot org well thank you jonathan for all of your insight today absolutely no thank you for having me you can have me anytime you know um it's been a long time since i've told my story you know but i i, I just want to be a blessing to others um and uh hopefully uh figure this thing out one day well, I think you are a blessing to others, if I say so myself, and I've truly enjoyed talking to you and learning your story, and I cannot wait to see where the foundation goes and everything you continue to do, and we're definitely going to be talking more, but a few of those key takeaways from today's conversation is you have to learn to be selfless to be successful. I think that is a note and token from everything Jonathan has said today that really runs true. When you're selfless and put others first, not only will it come back in positive ways, but it will teach you to grow and challenge yourself as well. As well as it is about having a genuine relationship because like Jonathan said, he got to places where he was because of building relationships. He got to the... um college level because of relationships he had built because of things he had seen at his high school and having those pros come and back let me, add this. And let me add this on the relationship piece none of my relationships in my life really took off until i got serious with my relationship with christ all right people always think about is how much you go to church and everything else but it's about having a true relationship with christ once you figure that piece out all right. And you got to do it yourself. There's no, I mean, you, you have to, God's going to talk to you in his own way. Once you do that, your other relationship was, was sore. You know, my marriage, my kids, other people that I just meet, me and Olivia just met and you think we've known each other, you know, for a long time. But once you align those relationships first, then the other relationships, you know, will, will, uh, will be that much richer. Mm -hmm. And I can't, and I want to highlight as well the fact that when you enrich those relationships, you're not just enriching the person that you're in a relationship with. You also enrich yourself as well as get off the bench and take action and help your neighbors. I think that is a challenge I want to give everyone today is get off the bench. Do that one kind gesture today and challenge yourself to do one every single day, whether it is helping that elderly neighbor get the mail from their mailbox just because you know they have challenges walking um, to their mailbox, or you're seeing someone struggle with kids in the carriage, hold the door open, help them to their car, whatever it might be. Do that one act of kindness. And all that's free. All that's free. It costs you nothing but time. Okay. You know, so again, with what we're doing, with the nonprofit, it costs money. But what Olivia's saying is do free things, okay? You know, just it doesn't cost you anything to help someone. As well as last but not least, be intention 
be intentional with hope and lead with love. I really think this is the sentiment of our whole conversation today is be intentional with hope and lead with love. This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Jonathan Olson. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.